put it out the way it was written. I, when I made some edits, but I, I just wanted it to be in the voice of an authentic 19-year-old because we don't listen to 19-year-olds. We don't listen to young people. Young people have problems. Some of them are very suicidal, as mm. you know. And, and, I want, and I confront these, these nightmares. I had them. You were uh, having suicidal thoughts at 19? Oh, yeah. yeah really? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, Due you know, to the divorce? This is before the war. <laughs> right. The divorce was 16. But you see, that's, going, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Was it yeah, due well, to the divorce, divorce alienation? Everything. I didn't know what to do in my life. I was lost, really lost. Which is, I'm trying to explain why I actually volunteered to go to this Vietnam combat because it was the only, there was nothing else for me. It was the way to maybe solve this issue. If I was going to off myself, I didn't want to do it. It would be done perhaps for me by the forces, you know, in Vietnam. Wow. So I was willing to, you know, willing to die, I thought. When I got there, of course, it, you know, after infantry training, I got pretty, I got put into the 25th Infantry and in uh, September of 67. So it was right as the war was getting to its hottest point. And I, I served in th three different units. I ended up at the 1st Cavalry because I got wounded twice in the 25th. I went through the, all the stuff in Saigon, then I went up to Anke, and then I moved on to Camp Evans in Quang Tri province. So I had quite a bit of experience there. And saw, saw a fair share of combat and uh, came back to the States as disillusioned, I suppose, very disillusioned. I realized I wanted to live because I didn't want to, I, didn't, I saw a lot of death and I didn't want to die. Uh, uh, you, you said something earlier to me before we talked about the, my Viet, when I said something about Vietnam, mm -hmm. I came back deadened. Deadened. Numb. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who I was, what I was. I was uh, totally, it's a problem for returning veterans, as you know, in any war, any place you don't. Our society was not geared to war. Our society, people were not enlisting or volunteering by any means. Most people were avoiding it. In my class mm -hmm. uh, at Yale and, and Hill School, all of these people, were, most of them were not going there. It was considered, it, it, that was for uh, poor people, right? And that, really, that bothered me. So I got my first real strong experience of living with the, call it the lower class Americans, but they were really good people. And I had, had much, there were many good people there. And at the same time, I got to know our black population pretty pretty well because I found them to be very powerful in my experience there. They, uh, in a way, they, they helped keep me alive, kept me human. The music, going back to the base camp, smoking dope, that kind of stuff in the rear is very important and keeps you, mm -hmm. it keeps you human. And uh, I've discovered soul music and it was just a good relationships. Whereas some other people have problems over there. They, they, you can let war. You can let war finish you off. It makes you very callous, very callous. It was a racist war in the sense that yeah, many many of us mistreated the Vietnamese. Didn't look, didn't respect them at all. The soldiers, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So and that, and that was a, you see that overall in our attitudes towards third world people, and uh, I saw a lot of that. I didn't like it at all. So. I'm giving you a long narrative. No, here. this is. I wrote a book about it. It's called uh, "Chasing the Light," and I, about my first 40 years. And I, I, I told that story because Vietnam plays a huge role in in America's destiny, which is where I'm going to go to in the in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. My father, being a Republican, uh, being pro-Vietnam at one point, uh, very much. He was an intelligent man. He wasn't. A, he was an economist, a Wall Street man. He. Uh, he he, he was very passionate in his views, and he stated them publicly. He was a writer, and today, among other things, he was he wrote a monthly monthly investment letter for his firm, and it was a very popular letter. So he was given the gift of expression. He was a very good writer. I admired him. Didn't agree with him. We fought like dog and cat after the war because he he didn't really respect to Vietnam. He, to him, World War II was the war. He was a lieutenant colonel. You understand the dichotomy, and here I was, a pot-smoking, long-haired, hippie type coming back from this war, but I wasn't a hippie, I was just a screwed-up veteran, you know? So, after a long period of drugs and this and that, I ended up back at NYU on the GI Bill, which is where uh, I went to film school. 
And because what else, you know, what else could I do? Didn't have any skills except how to how to fire a rifle, how to how to build a fire, how to live outdoors in the jungle. That was one. That was were my skills. So I went to uh, school for the, for two years. Uh, Marty Scorsese was the f youngest teacher there. I had him in a class, and he was very very. He moved me. I'm long, I, all the teachers were very good. The school was very sharp. Learned a lot. Wait, how much? How much further do you want me to go? No, keep. keep yeah. I'm actually very interested. Please continue. I'm actually very so interested. Martin Scorsese was your teacher at NYU. You were saying, Marty was a teacher. Yeah, he was young. Uh, I want to know to the point teacher. of first movie. Like, I want to know to the point of your first big movie and then winning uh, uh, an award for Midnight. At, uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's a few years ahead. I had to go through a lot of to a lot of uh, rejection. From film school, I mean, you come out of film school. I was driving. I drove a taxi in New York uh, because that was there, was there was no jobs for film. It wasn't younger people were not yet accepted the way they have been since. Uh, it was tough. I drove a taxi. It was a messenger. I was working in all temp jobs that I could get, uh, and I was writing. I I kept writing. Remember, I written a novel, so I kept writing screenplays. My first screenplay, '69. And it's a crazy, it reads crazy, but it's part of the development of a writer. You have to go through all these. I wrote eight, nine, ten, maybe eleven screenplays over those next six, seven years, and all of them were rejected. Although two of them were finally options, and that led to some kind of light uh, in, in Hollywood. I started to meet some people just off the options. Ma had married a Lebanese woman. Uh, who was very beautiful and well, had a job at the UN, so I was hippie. she was helping me. Uh, uh, I, I was living in her apartment. We were married, and Najwa, Najwa, Lebanese, I'm sure you, you know, uh, Christian Lebanese. So uh, I, I moved to Hollywood. We, we divorced after seven years. Together we and I moved to Hollywood, and started over again. I was very lucky in the sense that my first I got a job, a higher job to work on Midnight Express, which was a book. Peter, a big, uh, a, a hustling young producer, Peter Guber, at Columbia, wanted to make this movie, and and of course the story was fascinating about a Turk, a boy, American boy from Long Island was busted in Turkey, and for hash, went to jail for, uh, was sentenced to 30 years, but uh, it was a, quite a case and it went around and around. No, it was first of all, he was sentenced for five years and then he was resentenced for 30 years. Wow. The Turkish uh, system of justice at that time was very strange. Uh, and, the, and the jail was hilarious because if you had money in jail in Turkey, you, you lived like a king. But if you were just part of the foreign riffraff, Peasant. Uh, you lived pretty badly. Yeah. So uh, you can imagine the contrast. Uh, anyway, the movie came out, and it was a gigantic hit. Uh, it was 1978, 79. And I got an Academy Award. That was the most shocking Crazy. of all. Yeah. So if you enjoyed this little segment from the podcast, click over here to watch the entire podcast. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Take care, everybody.